Good morning from the Verizon 5G Labs in Playa Vista, California. I'm Jim Tabin from the Advanced Imaging Society, and this is Remote Control, the series dedicated to keeping our community of creative content makers connected. Movie theaters have opened up this week across the U.S., and advanced projections say that Warner Brothers' Godzilla vs. Kong will bring the box office roaring back to life next week. Added to the hundreds of hours being ordered by streaming services, and the production industry is getting excited. It's looking more likely that creative people, like all of us, could be busier than ever in the next 12 to 18 months. To get you ready and on the cutting edge, today we're going to see some very cool tools. Alex Webster is going to join us from Framestore to demo some rendering tools for fast-moving animators. Rick Champagne of NVIDIA and Josh St. John from HP will take a look at the new Remote Artist Toolkit. We're going to discuss Smart VR with HP Scott Rawlings, and we're going to demo some mind-boggling 5G and see how we are going to produce without wires. It's an incredible new 5G capability our friends at Qualcomm and Verizon and Sony are working on. And of course, we also want to thank our ongoing sponsors, Barbara Marshall of HP and Z Central Work Products and Rick Champagne of NVIDIA. They have been fantastic supporters of this series and we really want to thank them. Uh, we especially need to thank Michael Mansori and his amazing new platform that we're broadcasting from Meetmo that he'll be demonstrating later on in our program. And special thanks also go to Sony Electronics for their cameras, their phones and equipment Verizon 5G Labs for their great facility, Brave New Media, and our media and trade group partners, Computer Graphics World, and the NAB Show. It takes a lot of cutting-edge technology to bring Hollywood creativity to the world, and each year, AIS honors the latest technological advances in the entertainment industry with our annual Lumiere Technology Awards. Our winners will be announced in the press next week, and you can join Chairman Buzz Hayes and I on our YouTube channel next week where we'll announce those winners and we'll look forward to sharing that news with all of you. We had amazing, amazing entries this year and you'll be amazed by who won. Buzz will be joining us in just a moment to kick off our first session of the day. But first up, the latest trailer for Godzilla vs. Kong is out. This is going to be a monster hit and here it is. Right now Godzilla is out there and he's hurting people. We don't know why. We need Kong. The world needs him. can't be two Alpha Titans. In theaters and on HBO Max, March 31st, rated PG-13. That was amazing. I can't wait to see it. Anyway, thank you for showing that, Jim. That, that was awesome. Um, so today, we have a presentation from Alex Webster, who's the Managing Director of Pre-Production Services at Framestore, where he focuses on rendering tools for fast-moving animators, among other things. And after his presentation, he's going to join us live from London for a Q&A session. So if you have any questions, please enter them in the chat. You can see the chat running alongside the presentation. So enter them there, and we'll keep track of those questions and answer them uh, as, as soon as this presentation is done. So without further ado, let's take a look at Alex's presentation. Hi there, and thanks for the introduction and to AIS for inviting me over to talk to you today. Warmest greetings from uh, freezing cold London. Uh, so I'm Alex Webster, MD of FPS, which is Framestore's pre-production services division, which represents our work in visualization and virtual production for clients in feature film, episodic, immersive, advertising, and themed attractions. We're roughly 100 people working out of London with plans to expand across Framestore's global network. I was about to say that we work out of Framestore's London studio, but of course, for the last year, that would be wholly inaccurate, as like many other creative teams, we've been stretched across dozens of individual locations in the UK and abroad, working more as a network than as a team. 
In the last 12 months from lockdown one to nearing the end of lockdown three, FPS has grown from five people to over 100. And that growth has had to happen remotely and without human interaction, which in itself has been challenging. And to add to that, the implementation and design of novel, interactive, real-time tools and workflows as part of the boom in virtual production. And it makes for a hell of a ride and one which, more often than not, has not been entirely smooth, though it has been filled with creative success. So when talking to the guys at AIS about this presentation and the three central pillars they wanted to focus on, namely remaining connected, productive and inspired during such disruption, I was kind of posed with a question. Do I evangelise about what we've achieved and sell to you a beautifully designed and functioning toolkit and pipeline which represents the seamless integration of nascent real-time technologies with established visual effects workflows, or paint a more realistic picture of the challenges in connecting established pipelines and tool sets whilst adding interactivity to a highly evolved way of working? I think honesty is generally the best policy. For a bit of context, when we set about building FPS last year, our mission was to improve on an often siloed and fragmented production process by combining concept art, visualization, virtual production, and VFX services into one pipeline, which is driven by a connected team of artists in shot creation, animation, and VFX, who are empowered by tools which enable seamless production across Framestore's global network of studios. The theory is that teams collaborate earlier to better the creative process, liberated by a connected tool set and joined up thinking, which allows us to leverage an unparalleled collective brain trust by pulling teams together earlier, we improve the creative product and can respond holistically to our clients' needs for soup to nuts production. Through leveraging a global network of artists and technologists, we can inform best practice and find unique ways to solve creative and production challenges whilst delivering exceptional value, driving cost efficiencies and minimizing intellectual wastage throughout the production process. In striving to reach this target, one of our greatest challenges has been managing rapid development of game engine powered digital tools, which sees bleeding edge technology work at a level of robustness on a par with our battle tested film pipeline. There is an inherent newness that has informed our work since we established FPS. New creative services have evolved and are in high demand, which in turn brings new ways of making films. There is a new pandemic to disrupt established working conventions and a new economic landscape to deal with. There's a new experience of working from home and all the new attritions that come with that. There are new artists joining the film community who need to be trained in new programs and there is a new set of client expectations around the efficacy of new virtual production technologies and their ease of use, cost and availability. New technology, new workflows, new people, and new model equals opportunity, evolution, creativity and headache. But what we're building at Framestore is a creative ecosystem which allows a project to evolve from its earliest conceptual drawings through all forms of visualization and VFX to the final color process and ultimately delivering the final pixel. With the advent of FPS and the recent partnering with Company 3, it's very clear that we have the talent to deliver this vision. The main challenge, though, is in unifying the myriad complex and established pipelines that traverse multiple locations and which support numerous divisions, all of which have been designed for a specific task over many years. For the past 12 months, our technology teams have been fastidiously untangling and rebuilding workflows and tools to support and integrate pre-vis, tech-vis and post-vis into the film pipe, as well as beginning the work which will merge our networks to ensure a project can remain fluid across all divisions, and as such, liberating the creative process, whilst adhering to the stringent security measures which need to be in place in order to protect our clients' content. This means that teams within concept art, virtual art department, visualization, virtual production, VFX, animation and color can all be connected and immersed in a project from the earliest stage and have the context of the creative decisions which are being made before the work arrives with them to provide their particular skill in a way which is impossible on a normal production. Too often teams within visualization or VFX are not given vital context of creative decision making in areas outside of their purview and by joining up our tools, artists and networks we hope to provide a platform for greater collaboration and better sharing of information throughout pre and post production. Outside of pipeline technology, we have, like all technology driven creative companies, seen a huge uptick in the demand for and utilization of game engine tech to affect real time decision making in previs and on set. Commonly referred to as virtual production, VP is an often used, often misunderstood, and misappropriated term which features very often in the creative conversation. It's the term which, in isolation, represents a paradigm shift in digital filmmaking practices and infers a shift in thinking and philosophy from the concept of fixing things in post to the fixing things in pre. Relative to the themes here, conceptually, it's a suite of tools which allows filmmakers to be connected whilst working in isolation. As a springboard into v VP, 
pre-visualization or pre-vis is an essential part of the development process for feature film and episodic productions as it enables creatives to design, plan and understand shots or sequences far in advance of the actual shoot. Previs traditionally uses 3D imagery to visualize or design a show and utilizes a bespoke pipeline and digital toolset which is designed to facilitate the quick iteration of different staging and art direction options such as lighting, camera placement and movement, stage direction and editing for specific shots or sequences without incurring the costs of actual production. Previs is designed to be fast and iterative and to prove creative and narrative concept. In a pre-COVID world, Previs existed on set and in the studio with Viz supervisors and artists working hand in glove with VFX and stunt supervisors, DOPs, production designers and directors to help inform their creative choices at the beginning of film prep and to commit them to screen as rudimentary CG. During lockdown, studio lots have shut down, VFX studios have closed their doors and creative leads have all had to stay at home. So how have we managed to replicate the interactivity of working in close proximity when separated by literal oceans? through virtual production, that's how. We describe virtual production relative to the work we do in pre-production as an umbrella term for a spectrum of computer-aided production and visualization filmmaking methods which combine virtual and augmented reality with CGI and game engine technology to enable production crews to see their scenes unfold as they are composed and captured on set. These early entry tools exist within certain brackets and are optimized to be as user-friendly, portable and as intuitive as possible and can be used to bring people together, albeit in a virtual environment. Here's an overview of some of the virtual tools we use to allow remote collaboration in a film environment. A virtual camera is a camera system that exists within a 3D software program that displays a view of a 3D virtual world behaving in the same way a camera would in the real world. A virtual camera's motion can be driven by an animator, motion capture data or external controller such as an iPad. The camera's optical settings such as focal length, aperture and focus distance can be controlled by the user and determine how a virtual object or environment will appear on screen. We're able to provide remote virtual camera sessions which place key creative stakeholders in the same environment whilst giving them a platform to make shot choices which round trip back into previs. As an extension of this, virtual scouting in our proprietary platform Farsight allows filmmakers to navigate and interact in virtual environments, helping them make better creative decisions. Directors and DOPs can easily scout locations, compose shots, set up scene blocking and get accurate representations of filming locations in a virtual world which is constrained by the laws of physics. There are numerous ways to move around a virtual location when scouting using Farsight. These include flying, where you fly in the direction of the controller, teleporting, which allows you to quickly move position or teleport to wherever the controller is pointing, whether on the ground, on an object or in the air. Navigation provides various controls for moving around the scene, similar to using a gaming controller. Filmmakers can use the viewfinder to view the scene through the lens of a camera, providing the option to change film back, lens and focal point. You can take a snapshot of the camera view, which captures the scene at a given time, recording all the key information. Farsight is built on top of Unreal Engine, which makes the process of scouting interactive, meaning you can move objects around in virtual space in real time. You can draw in the scene or leave markers to highlight areas of, or objects of particular interest. Bookmarks can also be used to flag interesting locations within a scene. Each time you create a bookmark, it's added to a list, meaning you can select any bookmark on the list and teleport to that spot. You can also measure the distance between two points within the scene. As you move the controller, the distance measurement updates in real time. Virtual scouting allows all of the key members of a production to explore a scene together when multiple users are in a session, their names will appear on screen. You can teleport to another user's location by selecting that user. Not all users have to be in virtual reality to participate though. Sessions often work best when one of the artists is working from the desktop, performing complex actions that are hard to do in VR, but straightforward when sitting in front of a computer. Motion capture is a process of recording the movement data of objects or people so that it may drive other computerized forms, blending real life movement with digital characters or objects. Animation data is mapped to a 3D model so that the model performs the same action as the actor. Camera movements can also be motion captured, enabling a virtual camera to mirror a real world camera while an actor is performing. The motion capture system can simultaneously capture the camera and props as well as an actor's performance. Farsight Go, is Framestore's on-set visualization tool, allowing creatives to preview a live composite of CG set extensions, objects, characters, and animations within their physical set. It's a lightweight, easy to use handheld application giving creatives a live window into their VFX content while recceing and shooting. 
Farsight Go is an iOS application utilizing Apple's ARKit framework for tracking human pose estimation and depth-based compositing. Farsight Go supports custom film backs and lens packs and allows you to frame up on virtual content with centimeter accuracy. It is built using Unreal Engine, so the assets created in our other Unreal-based tools are easily portable to Farsight. It's also an excellent tool for briefing actors, working against blue screen, allowing all the storytelling collaborators to see the virtual environment for themselves. The total footprint is very light, requiring a single operator, an iPad, some fiducial markers and a laptop to support it. I hope this gives you an overview of the thinking behind our work and tools and shows how filmmakers, animators and artists are able to stay connected and productive during pre-production whilst being separated from one another. From my point of view, the perfect storm of lockdown, the improvements in engine technology and the creative potential of VR and AR all coalesce to usher in a new paradigm of image making and how pre-production can be immersive, collaborative and immediate, offering inspiration to movie and TV makers alike. Thanks so much for listening. I look forward to getting your questions. Alex, thank you. That was an amazing presentation. I could have watched that for hours. So thank you for uh, <laughs> putting those amazing clips in there for us. And thank you for joining us at a late hour of the day on your end of the uh, on your No, no, the it's, it, it's no problem at all. I'm delighted. And I feel like I should apologize for my terrible lockdown haircut that I was sporting <laughs> in, um, in that video. It was only a week ago. And, uh, and uh, yeah, it was curated by my 15 year old daughter. So I, I apologize, apologize for that. <laughs> we all suffer from our own version of COVID yeah. hair. So yeah. great. Well, thank you for being here. And yeah, we do have some questions that uh, uh, came from the chat here that um, I thought we could uh, address. The first yeah. one came from Sophia. She was asking, um, has the unpredictability of the pandemic improved aspects of the toolkits that you use that wouldn't be considered pre-pandemic? Yeah, I think I think you know it, the pandemic arrived at a point in time where I think there was a, there was a there was a lot of interest in virtual production, really stemmed by a lot of the um, work around the Mandalorian. So suddenly, you know, we all got thrown into into remote working at a point where the lift was the lid was lifted mm -hmm. on a different way of working, and you know, I think that suddenly the two things collided in this perfect storm. And it really forced this acceleration into development work, which companies such as Framestore and other visualization studios and VFX houses were doing to really fast track the development of those tools because suddenly there was a, a real appetite, a genuine appetite from filmmakers and clients to want to use them on real productions. And so suddenly we had to go from the theoretical in some instances is and uh, you turn those into production ready tools very very quickly and i think you know i, I sort of insinuated that in that uh, in that presentation that you know it's not we, we've achieved a lot during the last year but but a lot of the rapid development has been done whilst we're in production on shows mm -hmm. so long term i think it's it's going to be a huge benefit to to us and to a new generation of filmmakers coming through and it will have it's certainly accelerated that conversation and made and ushered in changes in a workflow which wouldn't have happened as quickly otherwise. So, you know, I think there there is there is some upside to this situation which we find ourselves in. And certainly for for businesses like ours, it has concentrated the mind, um, and it's meant that um, you know we have had to find novel ways to continue the um, continue working with filmmakers. And I think you know unlocking a lot of the power of of game engines to be able to work collegiately together in an environment and you know the, the thing about previs and um early stage development like that is it's it's iterative it's it's throw away to a certain extent it's it's a space with which to to play and experiment so you still want to be able to work in that really with that light touch and that sort of nimble environment where you can try you can experiment you can you can you know you yeah, you can try stuff and then if it doesn't work, bin it and then move on to the next. And I think that's what those tools actually allow is that kind of continuum that we were seeing in, in previous, albeit in now in a much more um, interactive, real-time way. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, sorry, very long answer to the question. No, yes. no, that's perfect. And what's interesting, I think, you know, the subtext of that is 
you know, having been a visual effects producer for many years, mm -hmm. one of the things that was sort of the mantra of a facility was that once you start a show, the pipeline never changes, right? You can't touch a thing because we have a movie <laughs> to deliver. And now we've gotten to the point where the, the innovation is happening so fast yeah. that we're having to adopt more of, you know, in the in the cloud world, we call it the CICD pipeline. Yeah. But this idea yeah. of just being able to iterate because the tools and the techniques and the and the the hardware, all those things change so fast that yes. we don't have time to sort of lock it down and better. We don't have all of the answers. We have to start with some core set that works and yeah. you know improve from there yeah. so it's impressive that you guys are well i mean it, it is you know it's it's yeah impressive to a certain extent terrifying to another but also <laughs> incredibly sort of um uh energizing as well because as you say you know we, we are working at the moment on on a five or six shows of different scale of different size but in a number of those instances we are rewriting pipeline as we as we go along mm -hmm. um and yeah. that really is to 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 open up this whole sort of ecosystem of, of creative services under one roof mm -hmm. so that a project like i was saying can go from its earliest concept and ideation through you know through all those different stages mm -hmm. with a with one kind of collective brain trust and that can be um you know factored in a lot of different ways so yeah that's trying to have a, a develop tools and a pipeline that can support all the different functions of of visualization and virtual production and vfx and animation simultaneously um whilst bringing in uh heavyweight vp is is definitely um an ongoing pursuit should we say and like you say the technology is is evolving daily we're involved in a, in a very big led volume show at the moment um which is shooting in 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 berlin and really on a on a weekly basis there's new iterations to the to the pipeline there's there's new hardware there's new workflows and so of course we're trying to implement as much as that as we can working closely with the, the hardware companies and the camera companies and the and the studios in this case netflix to be able to continue to really push and optimize um that whole workflow so it's uh yeah it's um it's a it's a really fascinating time um i think you know we nobody could have legislated for for the last year or so um and it really has kind of let the genie out of the bottle, I think, to a certain extent. In I think the the, the VFX businesses which we go back to will look fundamentally different to the ones that we that we exited quickly a year ago. So to that end, it's it's yeah, it's really exciting. Um, That's and we're great. thinking about a different, yeah, you know, essentially a different model. Yeah. Um, well, and you know what's interesting? I've I've always found in my career that uh, there are two great motivators. Uh, one is deadlines, and the other one is fear. <laughs> and uh, the fact that both of those come into play, I think, actually allows for some really interesting yeah. innovation. You don't have time to rethink these things no. to death. And also, I think, you know, people looking at this from the outside, looking in, especially from the software development side, I think they're, the one thing they're missing is the fact that this is a tool set that's solving creative problems that are sometimes yeah. hard to articulate. You don't know yes. when it's right till it's right. Right. Yeah. So you can't yeah. articulate the customer use case up front and, and articulate everything you need. You yeah. just have to add that function as you need it or take that thing away if it's not working. So yeah, and I think it's, it's very bespoke as well. Different people have different mm -hmm. ways in which they want to work and they, they, they want to be able to to the tools to function in specific ways and the UI to be ordered in a in a in a certain ways, which you know is part of our job to ensure that we can do that and those tools are malleable enough to be accessible to you know a, a you know a large generation of, of very skilled and experienced filmmakers mm -hmm. who to a certain extent this is you know this is new territory i think there's definitely a a, a fear factor around that quite understandably because suddenly you know you've got a, a bunch of techies giving you kit which you're unfamiliar with <laughs> and you know it that you can feel kind of exposed in that in that way so really we're trying to make the tools behave in a way which is absolutely familiar to the to the crew which are using them and, and our job is really just to provide those those tools and that platform mm -hmm. for for the filmmakers to make creative decisions early in the process and yeah. i think that's the, that's the thing now we can see those through the application of these tools we can see those decisions being made and then we can track them through an entire process which means that you know we so often we get into the, the expensive end of, of visual effects mm -hmm where you're looking to explore at that point. And actually, if that, if that explore, exploration could be done much earlier in the process, then arguably it's a it's a win win for everybody for 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 the filmmakers, but also for the studio execs who who obviously have a 
duty of care when it comes to looking after budgets. Absolutely. Now, speaking of toolkits, uh, one of the questions that came up is, uh, when will these proprietary tools be available on a wider basis? For example, Farsight. <laughs> Well, it's it's a really interesting question because we are we are wrestling with the notion of you know do you do we keep it something which is proprietary to us and it goes out with uh, our our TDs um, and our supervisors or is it something that we productize to to launch to a to a wider base of filmmakers um, and I think there isn't an answer to that at the moment but certainly I think with the work which certainly Unreal are doing in democratizing a lot of these tools. And making them accessible through through the engine, and our 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 tool set is built on on Unreal. It is giving, it's putting those tools into the hands of a of a new generation of filmmakers coming through, um, and there's an awful lot of R and D and development going into optimizing those tools at the moment. So they're definitely. I mean, you know, when I was at, at film school, we were shooting stuff on umatic tapes, and if we if we managed to get into, you know, to actually shoot with a film camera, it was just everything was so prohibitively expensive and you could never get your hands dirty. Whereas now I think, you know, this, this, this tool set will certainly, I think, whether it's by individual businesses such as ours, licensing and, and productizing them or the continued push from, you know, developers like Unreal, they will become completely utilitarian. They will be democratized. And they, you know, and that's the exciting thing for us actually mm -hmm. is, is looking at how that is going to liberate a whole generation of talent coming through to be able to start, you know, you can, with those and with one of these, you can, you can shoot your film, which is just such Isn't that a, amazing. <laughs> it, it is. I mean, genuinely, really amazing. Amazing. I mean, I've, I've got a, um, the same daughter who brutalized my, my hair. Uh, it's just about to, you know, she's just about to start at, um, at film school, mm -hmm. um, at the age of 16. And, and, you know, I look at the, stuff that they have to hand and actually what's really fascinating is that they're adopting virtual production at this stage so you know we're working with with producers uh, for that particular film school at like david Heyman, etc to make sure that the the bleeding edge technology which companies like ours are are creating filters down through that whole strata mm -hmm. um, and i think that's one of the things i just want to quickly demystify about the the virtual production tool set i think it's, it's been used on big budget tempo features and episodic shows to date but really we're designing these so that they can be used on independent independent features as well it's not is they shouldn't be prohibitive mm -hmm. depending on budget actually a greater part of the value is on probably low budget um quick turnaround tightly scheduled um shows so you know i think um i think it's one of the things which that there's a preconception that virtual production when you look at it in its grandest scale is very much the purview of, of the big mm -hmm. example, like the Marvel or Disney shows, where actually there's there's a version of it which is lightweight, accessible, um, nimble, and and tangible, which you know is accessible to, to to younger filmmakers because there's a there's a really good price point attached to it. Sure, and I, I think that's one of the biggest benefits actually of virtual production because. In a way, what you've done is you've you've short circuited the process of the idea to the screen. Um, yeah. You know, for those folks who couldn't even imagine putting visual effects in a film just because of the sheer cost and the time mm. in, involved in yeah. something like that. Um, now you have this ability to see what your movie looks like through the lens, and yeah. you know, which is frankly the way we used to do it, right? <laughs> yeah. But uh, now I think it's a much shorter circuit from having the idea, seeing what you're getting. You're not waiting three months to see that yeah. first composite to figure yeah. out if that background looks right or if the plate was shot correctly or any of those things. Yeah. Um, and that leads to a question here actually uh, from John Daly. Um, he said, because of the increased need and also increased availability for virtual production tools to be utilized, do you feel that your team has more input into creative suggestions on a production by being at the steering wheel of these devices and being able to see, essentially see the results quicker? Uh, yes, I think certainly we we are given an opportunity to collaborate more um but i think again it really comes down to to sensibilities of the people that we're working with some some directors we work with have a very very clear view of what they want to make um whereas others have a much broader comprehension of the sequence that they're looking to design and at that point will give us a much more open brief and it does provide a platform for for our supervisors to really ask questions and come up with with solutions and suggestions, but again, it's I think it's, it's 
again, these, these tools empower that, but they're not the means just to doing that if right. if the team in which we're working with, if our clients actually aren't asking for that. And that's one of the questions that we always have to ask right up front is, you know, if we're getting invo involved in a project early, what are the problems that we're being brought in to try and help solve? And sometimes, you know, like I said, a director will not want that, um, or a VFX supervisor or production designer will not want that level of, of uh, creative thought they just want to see their ideas executed and so you know for us it's it's judging exactly what um what the task at hand is but certainly what is uh, i think we are seeing more of a, um, a shift towards decision making happening much earlier in the creative process and visualization teams having uh being put in a position to be able to contribute more i think Mm -hmm. No, that's fantastic. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, a couple of questions just came up. Uh, one from uh, Jib Sky asking, how can they start a career in virtual production? He's going to be graduating or he or she will be graduating soon and uh, was curious. And I know it's it's changed what film school means, especially when you start to integrate yeah. things like Game Engine. So just kind of yeah. curious if you have any advice for budding virtual uh, filmmakers. Yeah, I think there's the there's various courses which Unreal um, provide there's a whole load of um, web content to get familiar with working within within the engine I mean and there's still unfortunately the old sort of uh, adage of trying to get a foot in the door still sticks to a certain extent so I think actually you know contacting the the companies that do that work and putting yourself in that shop window still goes um, a really long way but there are um, there are various, uh, and, and if, if he wants to follow up with me, there are various different um, organizations that provide a pathway for new talent coming into the industry and trying, um, again, to democratize that and diversify it because, you know, um, that's a really important part of our responsibility to the, to the industry at the moment is providing a, a way for new talent to come in, which, you know, Previously, they've come get, come up against closed doors, so I think um, there are uh, there are a number of different institutions and charitable organisations which can help in that respect. So certainly, um, I haven't got all the details to hand right now, but by all means, let that person follow up with me, and I can point them in the right direction. Will do. Uh, yeah, and um, I think that's all the the time we have questions for. Okay. But I, I really want to appreciate. I, I would really want to express my appreciation for your time here. And no, no, like no, I said, no. I, I could sit and watch your presentation for hours. No. And, and the work you guys do is absolutely amazing. And it, it really is transforming this idea of getting us back to. Uh, it's a it's basically a creative art. And sometimes we get lost in the technology part of it. Yeah. And now we're finding that technology is in, enabling the creative. It is, and I think we're we're at that inflection point, really, where creative and creativity and technology inform one another, and and neither should be weighted higher than the other. But you know, it's and that's why it's a really exciting time. So, so but I, I know you're, we're running over time, aren't we? So, um, I should I should probably sign off. But well, thanks, thanks, carry so on, keep awesome. up the amazing work, and look forward to talking to you again soon. Yeah, absolutely. Time. Thanks, Buzz. Speak soon. Bye bye. So. Uh, for those of you who have been with us for the last couple of weeks, we, we usually put up some poll questions, and this week is no exception. So this week's poll question, which you'll see here in a moment in the chat, um, we have a question for you to get today about working in the office again. As many of you may have read, the major studios are now talking about uh, with their employees about returning to their offices sometime after July 1st, and we're kind of curious what your plan is. So do you anticipate being back in an office with other workers and teammates, um, either in july in september in november or would you prefer to work remotely forever so in the chat please answer um, however you feel appropriate on this and what you're hearing and uh, i'll review these results in a little bit so thank you very much for your entries you'll see it right at the bottom of the chat window and now um we've got a real treat for you so from marvel studios this is a preview look at dr strange 2 in the Multiverse of Madness, which is coming next year. Sit back and enjoy. You gotta come see this! This doesn't make any sense. I've been away for many months now, and I've had a revelation. The true purpose of a sorcerer is to twist things out of their proper shape. 
stealing power, perverting nature. I see at long last what's wrong with the world. Too many sorcerers. I'm starting to believe that everything is meaningless. Learning of an infinite multiverse includes learning of infinite dangers. And if I told you everything else that you don't already know, you'd run from here in terror. You still think there will be no consequences, Strange? No price to pay. We broke our rules just like her. A reckoning. The bill comes due. Always. Amazing. Can't wait to see it. Next up, we're going to check in with two of our favorite tech thought leaders. Rick Champagne is the global media and entertainment manager for NVIDIA. And Josh St. John serves on the global product team at HP. So without further ado, welcome. Glad you're here with us. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you also to AIS for having us. So before I turn it over to Josh at HP, I'll do a quick warm up to introduce NVIDIA Omniverse. Um, so first off, though, I am sure you all agree that it's been an interesting time in the industry, um, but also a very exciting time. At, you know, there's uh, we're in the middle of major shifts in how content is created and consumed. Uh, virtual production is adding new life to productions, and we're really on the precipice of the next major wave of XR. We're also seeing uh, new types of content that's being tailored for mobile viewing environments. And so, you know, I, I really do feel like this is an exciting time. There's been a lot of innovation happening. NVIDIA has been in, uh, effectively a media and entertainment company since our early beginnings. We're still passionate about it uh, very much today. Uh, we work at the speed of light and we continue to innovate in this space. Um, so today I'll talk mostly about remote collaboration, but if you have any interest in any of these other topics, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. We'd, we'd love to talk to you about this. Um, so in the past year, of course, our PCs have become a way of communicating with the world, especially during the lockdowns we all experienced. So um, VFX and animation studios adapted very quickly. Um, many of them turned to HPZ Central Remote Boost. We did a, a blog on the subject uh, early on uh, last year. Um, but there, you know, your teams are globally dispersed. You have diverse skills and disciplines, and you're working with other studios. And so, really, making real-time remote collaboration uh, has been a necessity. Um, and it's not a temporary story, though. Um, there's a study out by Gartner that indicated that over 80% of employers are going to continue to allow their staff to work from home at least part of the time. And hybrid workplaces will rise too. And by 2024, remote, remote workers will represent about 30% of all employees worldwide. That's nearly 600 million employees. So uh, this is a very important topic and uh, really glad that uh, AIS is covering it here. Now, NVIDIA also needed to bring real-time collaboration simulation to our teams across the globe. And NVIDIA Omniverse is really a solution, a solution that we built for ourselves. It's an open multi-GPU enabled platform for virtual collaboration and also for real-time photorealistic simulation. The platform is actually based on Pixar's USD or Universal Scene Description Format. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with it. And it's also a powerful culmination of our core graphics, uh, compute simulation and AI technologies. And so one of the key pillars of Omniverse is to be an open platform where we do leverage open standards like USD, but also NVIDIA's MDL, which we open sourced in PhysX. And by being open, really, we can connect everyone together without bias. And we can also con connect uh, tools from different industries together uh, to do workflows that, that weren't possible before or extremely difficult. So in, in addition to the open collaboration, the goal of Omniverse is to simulate reality 
uh, with true physics, AI, materials, behavior, rendering. And like we do with our own GPUs, we fully simulate them before they're built. And so this is really the future for how all things will be built and operated. Uh, you know, we have to enable the world to simulate autonomous vehicles. So, you know, we road test them on millions of hours of different uh, road conditions and different environments, uh, different countries. And, um, and we do all of that in the virtual environment before we transfer that learning to an actual autonomous vehicle. And very similarly with robotics or uh, doing simulations on buildings uh, before they're built. And so Omniverse is really our, uh, our platform to do that. And so as a backgrounder, NVIDIA Omniverse has uh, some core components, and I'd like to share some of those with you now. So starting with Nucleus, Nucleus uh, really allows users to store, share, and collaborate on the project data. And this is what provides the unique ability to collaborate live across multiple different applications. And so Nucleus can work on your local machine, on premises, or in the cloud. It doesn't really require a, a lot of compute power, so it can it's very flexible in where you can run that also. Um, and then there's Connect, and Connect opens the portals that allow other content creation tools uh, to connect to the Omniverse platform and save USD and M MDL content. And so with Omniverse, um, you know, your artists all continue to work in their favorite industry apps. So, it, you know, if they're working in Unreal, they'll continue to work in Unreal and they can use Omniverse to connect to other apps like Maya and so on. Um, then there's Kit. This is a software development toolkit for developers uh, to create new Omniverse apps. So if you had uh, you want to create an app specifically for animation uh, or for lighting or look dev, you can you can expose just the UI that would have the tools that are most relevant to to those uh, artists. And then simulation is powered by our core technologies that uh, for simulation, like Nvidia Physics that I mentioned. There's also Flow, Blast, and Rigid Body Dynamics, and then RTX Render. And this is an advanced multi-GPU renderer based on NVIDIA RTX, of course, that supports uh, both real-time ray tracing and ultra-fast path tracing. So I mentioned that uh, you can create uh, different apps with Kit. We, we have uh, um, some that are already available. And Audio to Face, for example, would be one that lets you do audio-driven facial animation. Omniverse Create is more of uh, doing scene composition. Uh, if you're going to assemble light and simulate or render scenes interactively, uh, Create might be the, the app that you, you're working in. And I think uh, maybe for media and entertainment, the, the other obvious one might be Machinima, which is really for doing uh, game cinematics. And so um, here we have uh, an example. What you're seeing is um, multi-user collaboration. In the top, you have like a... Uh, Layout artist working in Unreal Engine, just moving uh, moving things around and getting them all placed properly. You have someone using Substance Painter in the middle on the left there, painting textures, and then someone affecting geometry, maybe a modeler, down in the bottom using Maya. And on the right, you have Omniverse Create, um, and you can see all of the changes happening in real time. So you can imagine your artists are working in their favorite apps. They have them on the left monitor, and then on the right, they're just using uh, create to see all of everyone else's changes happening in real time, all rendered in, in a unified viewport. So pretty cool that way. In this demo, you're seeing AI pose estimation for driving the performance of a character live inside of Omniverse. So the AI pose estimation is created from the raw camera feed, and then it's fed into Omniverse. And you can see the this character on the right um, is, is being controlled in real time. And then to go a step further, we bring in a tablet as a virtual camera to create the shot. And we're using the tablet's accelerometers and gyroscopes to control the virtual camera here. For fun, uh, you know, the, well, and you saw that the flag there is all dark. So the DP or director might call out, hey, can you move the flag? And because you're in Omniverse, you can continue to collaborate in real time. And so you can have someone making changes. They can be remote uh, here. They just happen to be uh, in the same room. And so that's uh, that's another great example of, of uh, how to use Omniverse. In this demo, you're seeing some um, remote collaboration. And so uh, let me just go ahead and press play here. And so we have uh, we have someone in St. Louis. We have someone in Santa Clara. Uh, they're connecting to Omniverse. And uh, this time, instead of using AI pose estimation, we're using Xsense suits to drive the performance of these characters inside of Omniverse. These two people are controlling uh, two characters remotely from different locations. And then, of course, you have Terry on the very far left. And uh, Terry has a, a virtual camera 
and uh, and he's he's basically uh, creating the shot. So all of this is is happening in real time. Um, of course, this is uh, a demo, but they're you know just having a little bit of fun there. And so that's uh, just a, an example of of a way that you you'd be able to do remote virtual production. So um, we did a, a short film of our own um, with our art department, and uh, it was called Marbles. We released this back in May of twenty uh, in of twenty twenty. At the time, we were in the touring uh, generation of our GPUs, and when we released it, it was running at seven twenty p on a single GPU at twenty five frames per second. There was no depth of field. Uh, there was only one dome light, one area light. I mean it still uh, looks beautiful. Uh, there was indirect uh, global illumination also on this. But um, fast forward to when we announced Ampere, which is our, our newest generation of, of GPUs. This was called Marbles at Night. We did a, a, a new version of it. And now we were running on a single Ampere GPU, an RTX A6000. We were running at 1440p instead of the 720p uh, from previously. And we were now running at 30 frames per second, but also the complexity was dialed up. We had depth of field, uh, 130 uh, area lights. Again, um, we also had uh, the, um, the indirect global illumination going here. So um, I definitely check out that video. You can just, you know, NVIDIA marbles at night uh, on a Google search and you'll, you'll find it. There's also a, a great use for it as a standalone artist. I, I mentioned earlier, if, you know, if you are working across different applications, and you want to start to unify your viewport, you want to unify your, uh, your or streamline your, your workflow, you can settle in on USD as your format. It works across these different applications. And then Omniverse could be that, uh, that viewport. So again, you're using Unreal, you're using Maya, and you want to see the changes of each happening live in, in one viewport. Uh, that could be uh, a way to go. So I think that's a, an interesting case there. Um, it's really easy to deploy, and it can run on any NVIDIA RTX GPU uh, from a laptop to a workstation or data center. And Josh is going to be sharing some of those details on the data center workstations uh, that, that they use. And you can see them on the far right there. Those are uh, Z4Rs and uh, Z8s, Z2 Minis. And, um, and so you can be running completely in a data center, and, and he'll be sharing details about a project that uh, we collaborated with them on with Framestore. And um, so if you want to learn more about Omniverse, nvidia.com slash Omniverse, uh, there's an open beta available for download. You can also, if you're a developer and you want to write some apps and different things like that, go to developer.nvidia.com slash Omniverse. And then there are lots of tutorials at omniverse.nvidia.com slash <laughs> tutorials. And so if you uh, want to go deeper dive, this was very high level today. It's a short presentation. But if you want to dive deep, we have our NVIDIA GPU technology conference starting on April 12th. And um, we have an entire track dedicated to media and entertainment. We have a full day on virtual production, a full day on animation and VFX, another day on, on uh, rendering. And we also have some video and broadcast uh, talks. And there's also a full track just on NVIDIA Omniverse. So if you want to do the real deep dive, you know, you can you can be filling your days with Omniverse content at uh, at GTC. So that was all I want to um, cover today. I'm going to turn it over to Josh St. John from uh, HP, and he's going to be taking you through a project uh, that we did with them recently. Josh? Hey, uh, th thanks a lot. Um, yeah, and thanks to AIS for inviting me to speak, and of course our partners at NVIDIA. Um, I am Josh St. John, Head of Creators for Z by HP, and uh, super excited to talk about uh, Z Central and Omniverse. Um, I, I really wish we were all together in person, but I guess it's kind of appropriate to speak about remote collaboration solutions completely uh, remotely. And uh, full disclosure, I am actually an AI that Rick created and is driving me from uh, the audio to fa uh, face app. <laughs> there you right go. Now. <clears throat> I, uh, my whole career, I've carried around a workstation, and uh, uh, it, I've had a pretty collective career. So the use case about um, unifying workflow with Omniverse immediately appealed to me from design and CAD work to visualization, animation, and, and immersive. I've always needed a machine I could trust. And uh, with Z Central, uh, I have on-demand compute power from 
anywhere. I'm going to fire off a video over here. Um, of course, at Z by HP, we make high performance uh, mobile desktop and centralized workstations. I'm sure many of you in the industry are really familiar with our products. However, you might not be familiar with our solutions offering of Zcentral Remote Boost. Um, all of our workstations, all of them, come with Zcentral Remote Boost capabilities, and this allows you to turn any high-performance device into a workstation. This means you can securely run all of your apps that require NVIDIA RTX, and you can turn a PC, Mac, Linux into a uh, uh, a workstation with multi-screen support, and you can invite collaborators to share on sessions in your device, kind of like they were just standing right behind you. And for all the IT ninjas and solutions architects and support staff that are supposed to make this remote uh, world uh, work, you can manage these teams through one simple interface and share the compute resources across your organization without the need for virtualization. It's turnkey, one-to-one -one human hardware relationship from virtually anywhere. Our uh, remote boost uh, was previously called RGS, Remote Graphics Solutions. Maybe some of you know it by that name. And we were investing in new features and capabilities long before we had to deal with this pandemic. Um, I use it every day with my teams internally. Uh, at a click of a button, I can connect directly to our Z4R. It's the new 1U rack-mounted workstation, and it's uh, got an a, uh, RTX A6000 in it. Um, I'm often jumping in between video editing, 3D modeling, photo editing, conferencing, and I can just easily invite peers and stakeholders to share my screen and control the device uh, themselves. Um, you know, despite this year, uh, Z Central Remote Boost will remain essential to our businesses, um, as now we can securely stream pixels to anyone who needs them. We've got a ton of features with more on the way. We have better support for Wacom, uh, multi-display support, graphics hardware acceleration, uh, remote USB devices or licensing, and other features. And uh, you can feel free to head over to uh, hp.com, download it, and take it for a test drive. When we heard about um, Omniverse, we were just immediately uh, recognized that these two solutions are just better together. Remote Boost made it possible to connect remotely to any workstation uh, and collaborate in the same application. And Zcentral plus Omniverse expands that to being able to collaborate with uh, distributed teams across a variety of apps, visualize, simulate in all in real time via USD workflow. Um, then we decided to reach out to our longtime uh, 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 customer and partner, uh, Framestore. Um, they had just come off making some new commercial for us uh, for our uh, new mobile uh, product. It was called Power Your Breakthrough. And uh, we asked them, have you guys uh, heard of Omniverse? And of course, they, we had an idea and they, they were game to, uh, to set it up and take it for a test drive. So what we did is we put a cluster of Z8s uh, in Fort Collins, Colorado. And uh, at that time, we loaded them up with uh, NVIDIA RTX 1000s. Um, and we started taking aspects of the, uh, the, 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 the campaign they had built and bringing it into Omniverse. Um, it was super exciting because it was right around the time um, Ampere was being announced and got us early access to an A6000. And when we installed it in the system, we saw nearly a 2x uh, uh, speed improvements in real time rendering. Uh, we made uh, these devices able to the Framestore team to work on. And I think Eckhart says it best when he, uh, he said that this naturally just changes the way that they're going to. Uh, and the speed at which they can evolve their ideas. Um, the last thing I want to mention of Central Remote is we were recognized with an engineering Emmy this year for its role in was up and running during uh, the unprecedented time. But uh, I, the, 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 the solution is, um, is definitely um, uh, going to be here for the long run. Uh, we're really humbled by the recognition, but more than anything, we're just thrilled to continue to equip people like you, equip creators anywhere and anywhere, and uh, you guys really inspire us uh, every every day. So thanks so much. That's it.
my side, if you want to learn more, of course, head over to hp.com or reach out to us. Happy to answer any questions. Um, I think we're going to do some Q&A. That was great. Gentlemen, thank you for being here with us. Um, and we have a bunch of great questions here. So, um, you know, we could we could talk about this forever and geek out on it. And I appreciate your time on this. Um, one of the first questions we have here is for Rick. Somebody in the audience is asking the difference between GeForce and Quadro graphics cards. Uh, does Omniverse support GeForce cards? Could you uh, articulate that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, GeForce cards are supported with Omniverse. Uh, any RTX card, in fact. So. Um, really, the the main differences that you'll you'll find is that uh, the NVIDIA RTX A6000 and the Quadro cards are really the enterprise grade hardware. So that includes things like ECC memory, GDDR6. Uh, you get massive memory capacity. So if you're working like in Omniverse and you you're uh, collaborating with other people, the geometry tends to grow much faster because you're not you, you know you're in a creative session. You're not spending your time optimizing. And so you can get up to 96 gigabytes with uh, with an NVLink bridge. Uh, it's also perfect uh, for just even if you're doing complex geometry and high res textures. Uh, there's also a sync port. So if you're doing virtual production, uh, the NVIDIA RTX A6000 and Quadros have Quadro Sync 2, which is a daughter card that lets you do uh, syncing for LED walls and projectors. There's also Genlock. If uh, you have a curved wall, there, there are warp and blend tools to correct for that. You can do like 32 um, high-res displays uh, using NVIDIA Mosaic. And this even does things like bezel correction. So if you were doing like, a, say, a digital signage display or LBE or something with uh, panels that have bezels, uh, you can correct for that. There's GPU Direct, which does things like it, it really accelerates things by um, uh, removing unnecessary copies uh, mm -hmm. to system memory. And so you're going directly to GPU memory in that case. There's also with HP, you know, you get certification with leading professional uh, creative tools. Uh, there's system level testing with HP. So they do thermal, shock, vibe, and they can tell you all about that. Um, there's also um, enterprise level support, three years parts, labor service. This is, you know, these are enterprise class uh, products. And so they're also data center certified. So um, if you're rack mounting your Z workstations, like Josh was talking about, you know, you would still be covered under warranty. Uh, if you did that, there's um, IT level system management tools, long life on product availability, because you're, you're, you may be doing a film for three years and you want to buy the cards that you did on year one. So, uh, and long life drivers and things like that. So lots of big differences. Um, but um, if you're an artist, uh, you're solo, you're, you just want to run with Omniverse on your laptop, it's got a GeForce, absolutely. That's great. Good to know. Um, we have a question here for Josh. Uh, does Z Central Remote Boost work on non-HP hardware? Absolutely. So it's in, it's included for free with uh, any Z machine, so you can get it up and running on Z machines. But we also have licensing for third-party hardware, and we support a uh, you know a variety of uh, platforms, uh, you know Mac, uh, Linux, uh, as well as the PC ecosystem. That's great. Um, yeah. Rick, uh, you mentioned some Omniverse connectors for Adobe, Autodesk, and Unreal. Are yep. there more coming? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, lots coming, uh, and there are a, a lot of others that I didn't mention. So there is a, a, a brand new Autodesk 3ds Max connector. Graphisoft, Archicad is coming. Blender's coming. SideFX Houdini is coming. I mentioned Maya is already there. Motion Builder is on its way. There's uh, also Photoshop, Revit, Rhino with Grasshopper. There's uh, uh, Trimble SketchUp, uh, I think it's already available. Um, and then there's DS SolidWorks coming, Adobe, uh, Adobe's Substance Painters available, but there's Designer as well coming, and then Unreal Engine. So, and then there are a lot of others uh, that'll be on the way. That's great. That definitely answers the question. So that's fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, and Josh, uh, Remote Boost, does it support 4K? Uh, yeah, um, we, we support 4K, multi-head uh, or multi-display. Um, we have uh, advanced video encoding mode that uses the RTX GPUs uh, or NVIDIA GPUs to give you even more features. Um, but yeah, we definitely support 4K and uh, multi-screens. Um, yeah, I mean, 4K is at the tip of everybody's tongue, so that's, that's great to know. Um, Rick, regarding the, um, let's see. Is the NVIDIA RTX A6000 the only Ampere generation professional GPU that's available right now? So, 
Y yes, uh, the A6000 currently replaces the uh, the Quadro RTX 6000 and 8000 class GPUs. Uh, we still have the whole Quadro line for the 5000 class and lower, um, but we also have a passively cooled uh, GPU. It's called the A40, and that's for data center deployment. Um, and we also released the uh, A100 Tensor Core GPU for AI data analytics and HPC. Um, but definitely tune in to our CEO's keynote at GTC. Uh, to see all of the new things, uh, software, hardware, whatever it is that our CEO will be uh, announcing, if anything. <laughs> <Tune in. laughs> exactly. What a tease. <laughs> I think GTC is going to be pretty remarkable. So I'm, I'm excited. As always. Sure. But it just yeah, seems like this year always. there's a tremendous amount of stuff coming out of the pipeline. So that's fantastic. Um, Josh, I have another question uh, regarding remote boost and whether you support the use of uh, Wacom tablets or if you prefer Wacom tablets. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't really know what's the right answer there. Um, but uh, we, I, we I know it. I know it. It's, it's Wacom. It, Wa is Japanese for harmony and com is computers. Perfect. We have but answered the, one of the if, parental questions yeah. today. Thank if you're you. on the East Coast, you might say Wacom. If you're on the West Coast, you might say Wacom. Wacom is more of a reference to the Sopranos, I believe. So, oh, there you go. <laughs> anyway, I digress. <laughs> Josh? <laughs> no, we, de we definitely support uh, uh, Wacom tablets. Um, we, uh, we, uh, we also um, have uh, uh, gesture support and touch, um, and uh, we're continually innovating on human interface. Uh, we see the, you know, as we've been in this remote world and uh, all of these new use cases, popping up. We're uh, investing in new features. So yeah, um, stay tuned. Stay tuned for all that. It's been a real lot of fun um, using Omniverse and uh, linking the workflows together with our teams. And I think what Rick said earlier, like all of our teams use different tools, input devices, different screens. And what Rick said is, uh, you know, the ability to aggregate all of that work in one place and visualize it is so powerful. We never had this kind of single view. And, uh, you know, being able to do it remotely from any laptop, I can look at these huge data sets in real time and control them with, you know, my device of choice. It's uh, It's been really exciting to work on the project with NVIDIA. That's great. You know, and you're you're answering a big question that people have had for a while too, which is how do we get back to a sense of collaboration um, now that people are remote? And obviously this works when you're all under one roof too, but it really uh, solves some of that problem of how do you iterate creatively as a team and work on things together where everything doesn't have to wait for the last person to touch it before you get a hold of it. And so I think the, the work that you folks are doing is remarkable in terms of just fostering collaboration in a way that I, I think ultimately will will cement this idea that people can re work, work remotely from now on. There's no really no reason to be in a central place anymore. Um, so I have one more question here, and this one is for Rick. Um, you talked about remote workstations with Zcentral, but what other options does NVIDIA provide for remoting? Yeah, there's a host of other remoting solutions that run well on Z by HP, of course, and there are cloud solutions available through major CSPs like Google Cloud, naturally. And uh, we also have our own vGPU solutions that work well with Z. Um, the benefit of vGPU is that you can do fractional GPU, so if you uh, you know, wanted to have two or more users sharing a single GPU, um, you could do that. Or if you want to do GPU pooling where one user gets four of them because they're doing, uh, you know, lighting and they need some faster rendering going on, you can do that. Um, a lot of our customers, though, they choose HPZ Central because it's low latency, the IT manageability, all the stuff Josh mentioned, like it's built with artists in mind, so it supports Wacom tablets. Um, and it also happens to be free with every Z workstation. So I think, um, you know, uh, we, we have a blog, it's, I think it's called Monster Moves, and, um, and, and it goes into some of the studios using Z uh, Central. That's fantastic. Well, I want to thank you both for your, not only for your, uh, your amazing contributions from the technology standpoint, but from, for your time today. <laughs> I know we, we live in a very busy world where we're, we're saddled with meetings all day long, so really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us all about this and can't wait to see what comes next. So I appreciate everything you're doing and look forward to the next time we talk. Thank appreciate you both. Being here. Thank, thank you for having us. So I've got some poll results for you folks. Um, and uh, to reiterate the question, the question was, how soon do you anticipate being back in the office? Um, interestingly enough, none of you want to go back as late as November. Nobody. Um, however, a significant portion of you want to go back a, a little earlier than that. So starting at the bottom, we've got no one wants to come back in November. 
we've got uh, 16% of the folks that want to come back in July. So a few folks are ready to come out this summer. Assuming you have your, your vaccinations, you're ready to go. And the folks that want to work at home for the long term is 35%. But the overwhelming majority at 48%, nearly half of our respondents have said they are willing to come back to work in September. So I guess we'll see you in September back at the office. But be safe. And don't forget, you still have to wash your hands and wear a mask. All right. Thank you. <laughs> so now from New Line Cinema, written by Scott Russo and directed by Simon McLeod, here is a sneak peek at Mortal Kombat. First learned about this seven years ago on a mission in Brazil to capture a wanted fugitive. When we got there, it tore through our unit in seconds. The target had superhuman abilities. It had the same marking you do, Cole. It's a birthmark. What do you mean? He was born with it. It's not a birthmark, Cole. It means you've been chosen. Throughout history, different cultures all over the world reference a great tournament of champions. That dragon marking? I think it's an invitation to fight for something known. Mortal Kombat. These are your champions. I'm Sonya. That's Kano. I'm Liu Kang. Thanks, Jax. Kong Lao. Lord Raider. The fate of Earth is in our hands. No matter how many of my people you put in the ground, we will not fail. Kill them. I am Sub Zero. fucking beauty for another amazing movie can't wait to see it all right so you've probably been asking yourself what's happening in vr these days well what lessons have we learned from the next generation of vr based on all the great work done to date well we've asked these questions to scott rawlings and who's gonna he leads up hp's xr software and platform work and he joins us from fort collins colorado please welcome scott Hi everyone, I'm Scott Rawlings, one of our team within HP working on advanced extended reality solutions that we hope will usher in a new era of immersive technologies that will help transform how we work together, how we create, how we learn, and how we improve our well-being. I came into XR technologies via a circuitous route, first working as a design engineer on some of the most advanced flight simulators in the world, and later bringing the first nonlinear edit and compositing solutions to market, then pioneering human computer input for digital content creators, and finally now working with advanced technologies to bring it all together with bioanalytic VR solutions. So without further ado, I'm super excited to share what we've been up to and how we think it will change the world for the better with help and support from partners and the developer community. This all started when Tico Bayagas in HP Labs asked the question, we're all different. We learn differently. We find our own path with entertainment. 
We experience design each in our own unique way. How can we enable VR experiences to adapt to the individual? This question couldn't come at a better time. Recently, I was speaking to a futurist who told me that more is likely to change in the next 10 years than mankind has experienced in the past 100. Part of what's driving this change is the confluence of artificial intelligence, virtualization, simulation, robotics, and other advanced technologies. Tico joined with our commercial XR R&D team, myself and other advanced thinkers within HP to formalize plans for what we lovingly refer to as Omnicept. For us, this name encompasses the many ways we sense and perceive what's going on with the participant in the VR experience. In technical terms, we call this human inference. By leveraging bioanalytics based on machine learning, we're able to deduce in real time the level of mental exertion, and we're working on approaches to infer outward expression, internal emotion, fatigue, and other human insights. In the future, this same approach can extend beyond the boundaries of extended reality solutions with support for other HP and third-party products. Now let's take a minute or so to watch a short introduction of HP Omnicept. In order to infer what a VR participant is experiencing, we needed to create an immersive VR headset. HP Reverb G2 Omnicept Edition is this bioanalytic VR headset, and it's a key part of our solution to kickstart what we're calling Smart VR. We reviewed a variety of sensor technologies to balance what they can help us achieve with human inference versus how intrusive they might be to wearing a VR headset. The HP Omnicept Edition headset is the culmination of this achieved balance. And our first human inference that will be launched with Omnicept is called Cognitive Load, which measures and reports the level of mental exertion of participants wearing this headset. This exciting headset hits a reasonable price point while achieving breakthrough capabilities that dovetail with our Omnicept software developer kit, with plugins for Unity and Unreal Engine. Hitting the street at roughly US $1,300, this headset integrates a heart rate sensor, advanced eye tracking from our partner Toby that supports pupillometry and eye movement, and a mouth IR camera. With this Reverb G2 headset, we work closely with both Valve and Microsoft to achieve class-leading 2K by 2K per eye resolution with excellent optics. Additionally, we expanded the range of motion using four cameras to track the hand controllers, which have industry-compatible button layout. To complete the package, we've added Valve's well-received open-ear headphones for an awesome spatial auditory experience. This new VR headset marries up to HP's Omnicept SDK to empower breakthrough VR. Our Omnicept Software Developer Kit, or SDK, refines the headset's core sensor data and makes it simple and straightforward to improve your VR experience. Human inferences, like cognitive load, are also provided as part of this same Software Developer Toolkit. Omnicept includes a runtime that operates adjacent to your VR application so that these user insights, like gaze direction, heart rate, and cognitive load are always available in real time. So why does this matter? What difference can it make to our VR experiences? 
Well, imagine you'd like to screen a documentary film to better understand your audience response and engagement. Your current approach is to screen the film in a small theater and then run participants through a brief exit interview where they recall their response to key moments. There are many factors in this process that make this approach rather imprecise. Now contrast this to watching the film within the bioanalytic VR headset where emotions and level of engagement are accurately recorded throughout the entire screening. The participants' responses are based on good science and enable a better understanding of how that film is experienced. One of our Omnicept software developer partners, Thea Interactive, are taking this idea a step further by enabling design and human optimization with a solution they call Claria. Let's get a brief overview of what they're up to and how it relates to this approach to smart VR. Introducing Claria, an innovative and exciting set of tools that gives designers access to the most valuable testing data available, the unfiltered biological reactions of their test subjects. Unlike focus groups or product demos, where outside influences and personal perceptions are almost always a factor, Claria's data sets are exact representations of the biological responses of testers. Claria is designed for architects and engineers, retail and manufactured product designers, and the aerospace and automotive industries, and allows users to easily configure multiple design iterations for A-B testing in virtual reality. Using design files created in Unreal Engine and viewed through HP's Reverb G2 Omnicept Edition headset, Claria monitors and measures heart rate, eye movements, and cognitive load. With an easy-to-use interface and the ability to produce actionable data, Claria is the go-to solution for those who want to make better informed design decisions based on authentic, biologically-backed business intelligence. Another example is the ability to introduce entirely new forms of immersive entertainment. Narratives now have the ability to branch based on insights like cognitive load, emotion, gaze direction. Each time through the entertainment, we can have an entirely new experience. And between various participants, each of us would have our own individual storyline. This approach promises to encourage new kinds of social interactions along with repeat participation. Another great example is learning and development, which is an industry that is into the hundreds of billions of dollars. With insights based on cognitive load, immersive training experiences will accelerate human performance and indicate when the trainee is ready to move from virtual to hands-on. This approach will be especially effective when the skill being learned correlates to higher risk scenarios and crosses over both simulation and procedural training opportunities. One of our Omnicept partners is innovating how we improve our public speaking skills. Let's take a moment to see what Ovation are up to with HP's Smart VR platform. The fear of public speaking is deep-rooted and widespread. Common wisdom has been to practice in front of a mirror well, that mirror is being replaced by the virtual reality screen. Everyone has something meaningful to say, and our goal at Ovation is to give people the confidence to say it. One of the things we've always struggled with is when are they ready to translate from the virtual world to the real world? Omnicept it provides us with this extra layer of information to make sure that our software is actually taking their training to the next level. With Omnicept, you can see all sorts of different analytics that are provided. The user can go through our analytics menu and they can see things like how their heart rate changed over time throughout the course of their practice speech, how their cognitive load changed over time. These metrics in combination finally give us the confidence to tell these users, you're ready. You're ready for the real world with this speech that you've been working so hard on. Integrating the Omnicept SDK into Ovation was incredibly easy. They have a developer portal that helps you get the SDK fully implemented. 
the time it took between when we first started the process of integrating the SDK and receiving the sensor data was less than 15 minutes. HP is iterating on their technology and their hardware at an incredible pace. They're adding all sorts of different features that us as developers really, really want and can take advantage of. And I think once customers get their hands on the hardware and the software that takes advantage of the new features in that hardware, they are going to see that virtual reality has arrived and is ready to fully deploy within their organizations. Well-being is also embracing VR technologies to assist people overcoming phobias, the impact of past trauma, and to distract from discomfort. This platform approach is instrumental to provide the insights necessary for these VR experiences to dynamically moderate exposure and distraction based on biometric feedback loops. This process helps to dramatically accelerate positive outcomes. Another great example is the creation of digital 3D content that often involves large teams collaborating on complex projects. A wide variety of directors and stakeholders are involved. VR technologies help us to get into the same virtual space at human scale to present and discuss evolving concepts, but our avatars lack natural expression. If communication is 90% nonverbal, VR collaboration needs to feel more human. Our team are working on expression as a future release of our Omniset platform so we can join from remote locations and bridge across international offices to work together on 3D creation and design more naturally and more intuitively. Bioanalytics must be secure and adhere to strict privacy standards. When developing solutions that use sensitive biometric information, Privacy and security are so important to all of us. Our Reverb G2 Omnicept headset has firmware that secures the data during capture and no data is stored on the head-mounted display. The HP Omnicept SDK has terms and conditions with stringent requirements for our enterprise customers and ISV partners, including adherence to GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation. HP's approach forms a strong privacy and security chain from the person in the VR experience all the way back to our Omnicept solution platform. This commitment to security and privacy comes from one of the most trusted technology brands in the industry. HP's new Omnicept VR platform will enable 3D creative and design collaboration that in many ways will be more powerful than meeting in person. Being able to see heat maps that show emotional and cognitive response in conjunction with creative and design interaction, the possibility to explode parts and see them as if you're there from any angle, and the ability to experience every aspect of design and then dive deep into the implementation details. This and more will transform how key stakeholders experience and understand our designs at a more fundamental level earlier in the process. And smart VR like HP Omnicept is an opportunity that extends beyond research and design. It also promises to help transform learning and development and to enhance how we overcome phobias and distract ourselves during uncomfortable procedures. I and my colleagues in our commercial XR team appreciate your time today and we hope you'll take an extra moment to check out HP Omnicept at hp.com forward slash Omnicept. We'd also like to extend a special thank you to Brett and the Remote Control 2 organizers. We really appreciate the chance to be here and to participate. Now we're happy to have a few minutes for live Q&A. Thank you. Thanks for being with us today, Scott. That was an incredible presentation. And I can't wait to try this technology out myself. I'm, I'm sure our audience is thinking the exact same thing. Uh, VR has come a very long way since uh, we first started talking about this a few years back. And, and uh, people went off in a million different directions with VR. And you've certainly landed on some very useful applications and some really incredible um, collaboration tools, which I think is the thing that we really should be focusing on right now, now that people are still working uh, 
remotely. So, um, and I do have a question from the the uh, the chat here. Um, one of our viewers is asking, with all of the extra user data the headset collects, are you able to anonymize the data and offer opt-in features for the users of the technology? Yeah, so I think it's important to note that the the headset, uh, this particular headset, we codenamed it Carbon. It's the it has a long name, HP Reverb G2 Omnicept Edition. This headset um, doesn't store any data, and the firmware protects the data at the point of of where it's collected and passed on um, to the to the attached host PC. Um, the way that we're managing this is that we secure the data to the application developer and the application that's running. We have a runtime that's got the secure data coming into it, and the VR application is running in parallel and communicating with this what we call runtime application, this Omnicept runtime. Um, every developer that we bring on to our Omnicept platform, um, part of their being able to have access to the platform is they have to agree to GDPR, the Global Data Protection Regulation, and any other stringent uh, requirements are in place like from, from places like California and other specific countries. So, um, so part of this is us securing the data to the application developer, and part of it is making sure that our developer ecosystem is trustworthy and that we're only bringing on the right kinds of partners who can secure this sensitive information um, the rest of the way through through the pipeline. Yeah, that's very important to note. So thank you for articulating that. I think yeah. that's uh, on, on the top of everyone's mind these days uh, when they're talking about sensitive information, not the least of which is when you have creative teams talking, you, you need the ability to talk freely and not feel like you're being judged and not feel like somebody else might be listening or whatever. And so I, I think it's important that these uh, these are taken into consideration. Um, now, the technology itself has a wide variety of applications, uh, even just within the media and entertainment industry. Um, was it originally developed for media and entertainment or were you already looking at the broader use cases when this? No, we were, we were already looking at, at quite a broad range of use cases. Um, uh, we're, we're working on um, carrying the, our first inference engine, as, as you heard, was the, the cognitive load, which is the real time level of mental exertion while you're in the application. All these human inferences have context. So if I'm in a flight simulator and engine number two goes out and I'm having problems with my hydraulics, um, my, my cognitive load isn't just going up because I have to deal with a lot of things at once, but it's probably going up also because it's quite stressful. <laughs> and that's also taking up a lot of my attention and mental exertion. And so that's one context, you know, having to count backwards from a hundred by seven um, while doing three other tasks, that's a different kind of cognitive load. So, mm -hmm. um, the application developers obviously are going to know what the user is doing at any given moment and be able to relate what cognitive load means in that use case at the moment that that person is in that experience. Um, we're working, uh, as I mentioned, on emotion, on ex real-time expression, and, and some other cool things to come. And uh, this has really cool application for media and entertainment, both from a research and insights point of view, mm -hmm. but also from this dynamic narrative, you know, being able to adapt storylines and have dynamic content and whole new ways to think about entertainment and how entertainment is expressed uh, and enjoyed. And, but it also, you know, training, training and, and simulation is a, a half almost a half a billion dollar business so um how how our learning and de development occurs in businesses um well-being uh health you know, there's a lot of heartwarming examples of uh for example heaven forbid but a child getting cancer and having to go through chemotherapy you, you don't you typically don't want to have to impose a lot of medicine in that situation and being able to distract 
um, the child from the discomfort and, and have them have a better experience uh, and be entertained in the process. So it's a, it's a whole new way of thinking about entertainment and how it can be applied to, to real world scenarios that, that make our lives better. I think that's incredible. And, you know, it's interesting because we, we, we like to think the media and entertainment industry is unique in many ways, but uh, media takes many forms. And whenever we're watching things or listening to things that would definitely qualify as media and the way people access things these days is important. But also I think the way they react to that experience, I think is important. And that's something that's been difficult to capture. Um, uh, and, and to your point on wellness, I think that's a, that, that applies to every industry, right? I mean, I, we... I, I, I want to say something to this because, because for all the media and entertainment people out there, um, these technologies are opening up new opportunities for anyone who has these skill sets, mm -hmm. um, narrative, uh, creative being applied in whole new ways. We call it serious games, but it's still game development. It's mm -hmm. still interactive, engaging, and all the same skills that are applied to make entertainment work uh, absolutely apply in most of these, what we call serious game scenarios. And um, I, I and my, our teams are working with a diverse array of, of people and they all came from the game industry, all of them. Every mm -hmm. single one started out in <laughs> the entertainment. So um, that's so great. That's a, it's a good point you pull out, Buzz. Yeah, and it's interesting because the, the we've seen the 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 division between game development and and uh, media development that that line has been blurring for many years, and we've seen it coming, especially with the notion of virtual production and leveraging game engine itself. But what's interesting is the mindset is a little bit different. I mean, I had an experience of teaching uh, at the university level where we were teaching uh, filmmaking on the one hand, but students wanted to be able to, we, we were teaching stereoscopic filmmaking, they wanted to be able to use that in game engine. And you quickly realize without the right tools, those are two completely different mindsets. It's basically you need to align with the engineering school and with the film school in order to get anything to come together. And now these tools are starting to make that line blurred too, where not everyone has to be a coder uh, to get things done, right? So that leads actually to another question here is about the the ability to um, use this technology in universities and, and if that's being adopted um, as well as for location-based entertainment and if you could talk about the, those two areas a little bit. Yeah, I'll, I'll just give you one example because it, uh, I think it's fun to make these kinds of questions really tangible and just uh, help inspire the, the kinds of stuff that really is happening out there. I, I went to, so I live in Fort Collins we have a large 30 to 40,000 uh, student university here called CSU, um, Colorado State University. And uh, of course we try to support our, our local community. And so our CTO and I went out to support a hackathon um, with the, the creative and engineering students at CSU. And um, two things have grown out of of some of the work going on there. One is, is that um, a professor in the, the medicine, medical area was, has been able to fuse every different type of human scan that you can imagine into one complete human body kind of mesh scan. It's a mashup scan. And they're able to actually view your or my anatomy in detail and see things they could never see before. So that's one thing that's grown out of, of this hackathon type of work. Another one that was really interesting that I, that I was super inspired in is that uh, three or four students literally over a weekend working 24 seven came up with this idea to use VR to diagnose um, and, and do an analysis of, of concussion. And so it was fascinating to see that they're using the IMU, the inertial motion unit in the VR headset to be able to say, what kind of balance do I have? Um, do some cognitive tests to understand my cognitive evaluation. So they can do a much more robust and turnkey um, concussion, post-trauma concussion analysis with VR than they could do in any other way. And it's much more scientific. 
And the fact that they came up with that idea and were, was able, were able to execute it in a weekend is just, I, I think it's just mind blowing. Well, that, that's also a testament to the technology that you developed, right? That they have access uh, to technologies that maybe weren't in the right combination for them before, and now they are. So it gives them the ability to start making these connections in various ways and trying these things out. And I think it's amazing. And we are in this world, we were talking about this in the last um, presentation about the notion of, you know, especially in our in the media and entertainment world, pipelines, workflows have been very much carved in stone. You start a movie, you're on that journey for 18 months, two years, if it's a big visual effects thing, you basically have to set up a workflow and you have to live with it until the film is delivered because you can't risk breaking something. Mm -hmm. Now this idea of having technology that constantly lets you push the envelope and and try new things. And you know, you we we're in the tech world, we're probably tired of hearing this idea of fail early, fail often, but it, it really is a lot that could be learned in the media business about trying things and refining things and making these things uh, solve problems that maybe we didn't know how to solve before, but now we have the ability to do that. So I think uh, what you're doing in the combination of those things, this is far transcended what anybody thought VR was going to be if you look back five, six years ago, right? What you yeah, folks are doing right. is far transcended that. Yeah, I'll draw out some analogs with your example. You know, the if you do a movie that has some really complex 3D assets and you've got you've built up tremendous value in the in the creative assets, the 3D assets that have been created, um, of course you want to leverage that for movie two, movie three, et cetera. Well, I, I think in many ways the same thing applies, but even with more dynamism in interactive uh, media. Um, because not only are you creating the assets, but you're creating the the stuff like we're working on with how do you apply human inference? How do you apply the machine learning? And if you apply that in a in a model and in a in a unique way that can also apply to another use case, you can build a whole new product that's incredibly leveraged. And mm -hmm. so this idea of leverage um, still still carries over into this this new type of set, sets of technology. No, I think it's remarkable. And I, I, I really appreciate the fact that you are always pushing out to the, the, the leading edge of, of this kind of innovation because uh, it's, it's necessary, especially now um, where collaboration in person is becoming more and more difficult. But also this is allowing collaboration in ways that we never even imagined. And we're keeping track of the people in the headset too. I think that, you know, to your point about wellness before, that's something that seems to get left behind sometimes. We have all this technology, so I guess we're supposed to spend more hours staring at things and, and not worrying about the people underneath it. Yeah. And and you're, you're definitely taking a holistic view. So I really appreciate that. And uh, yeah. with that, I, I just wanna thank you for your time today, Scott. I know you're a very busy person yeah. and I appreciate you putting this presentation together for us. And uh, I look forward to seeing this all, all evolving and I can't wait to try it, to be honest with you. Awesome, so, thank you so much. Thanks again, it's okay, great to see thank you. you. Take care, everybody. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Jim Chabin. Jim? Thank you, Scott and Buzz. Remote control has been coming to you from the Verizon 5G labs in Playa Vista, California. The labs have not opened yet, but we've been welcomed in to talk a bit about 5G and what it can do. The easiest way to describe the impact is that 5G represents the ability to work and produce without wires. If you're a studio, 5G will connect every aspect of your production securely and at lightning speeds. If you're a broadcaster, 5G could allow you to replace your news van. In short, a 5G cell phone will have the power of a truck full of cables, 100 times faster in some parts of 4G. Here to discuss it is J.C. Straley of the Los Angeles Verizon 5G Lab. Welcome, J.C. Thanks for letting us in here for the last few weeks, and, and thanks for coming in this morning to talk. Yeah, thanks for having me in. So first of all, tell us about uh, 5G. It's been on the radar for years, uh, but it seems, what makes it real in 2021? Honestly, your question couldn't have better timing. You know, with the C-band, the airwaves that we just acquired over the next 12 months, we have Verizon, we're gonna be delivering our ultra wideband experience performance over C-band. It initially will be available in uh, about 100 to about 100 million people in 46 markets, 
and over time it's going to increase to 250 million people. So this spectrum, I like to think of it, it's the rocket fuel for those useful applications that, that we've been talking about through, throughout the conference. Yeah. Um, what role does the 5G lab going to play in, in bringing the, the 5G to the LA area? Well, you see where we're located. We're right here in the heart of the production zone. And even within this building, we have movies, TV, sports, games, and, and you see the gaming uh, team that we have here. And so it's just a, we get to work with these partners on gaming and AR and VR and volumetric. And we even put on live events. And when we do the launch event on May 5th, uh, we're going to have like a live music event showing what we're doing with virtual production. So, so, so I got a 5G phone and uh, I got a new iPhone about a month ago. When I walked into the Verizon 5G lab here, it did everything but fly around the building. Uh, it's so fast. Um, what is, from a production standpoint, if you work on a, on a television or theatrical production, you're on set or you're on location, what the people who are watching this, this uh, program, what is 5G going to do for them in their work? In one word, I'll say it, it's going to simplify workflows. You know, instead of having to do pre-production and build all this infrastructure and connect it into all these wires and networking, it'll be there ready built for you. And then on top of that, we have our edge compute, which is AWS and Microsoft Azure kind of uh, uh, built into our network. And you can run all your editing and working and all these workflows. Instead of like having to spin it up, you can just show up on set, uh, connect, and then, uh, you know, tell the stories that you want to tell. So you could focus more on the stories than the infrastructure. That'd be my message. Well, well the, the uh, technology that we've been using to produce these are a Sony 5G phone with a Snapdragon Qualcomm chip inside and a Sony camera. So it, it, it feels like this is going to become uh, a, a, an immediate solution for a lot of people. Warner Brothers, I know, is going to production without wires. Obviously, they're owned by AT&T. Uh, Sony's involved, uh, Disney's involved. So it feels like what was a conversation is now going to become really an action plan, right? Yeah, it's, and, and including using this uh, Meepmo software that you guys have, just bringing it out all in and integrating it. Yeah, it's, it's, that's what it is. It's the idea is that dynamic iterative uh, workflow instead of stage by stage sequential, you can make it all at once. You know, when, 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 what Southern California's rollout going to feel like? What, what should people be, you know, anticipating as far as 5G cell coverage? Actually, like I said, as we expand uh, with our incremental bandwidth, uh, with, right now we have ultra wideband available throughout Los Angeles and, you know, in selected areas. And then as we roll out C-band throughout the rest of the year, in a way it'll be almost, I'll say, you won't even have to think about it. You know, you know just like you said, when you walked into the lab here today, you turn it on. Uh, you connect, and you're not worried about the network. You're not worried about the compute. What you worry, what you really focus on is the experiences that you want to create and share. So well, that's how I would see it. Everything from uh, driverless cars, right? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, all of these things are going to depend on uh, or use uh, 5G to accelerate their plans. So it's really yeah. exciting. We are so lucky that Verizon, that you open your doors, uh, Usually uh, we can hear hammers and, and construction crews working here to get ready. Your opening date is, did you say May 5th? Yes, it is May 5th. All right. Well, we'll let people know about it, but we are uh, thrilled that you would let us in and do our production. And, and I think we're going to have some conversations down the road because I think what you're working on and what we're working on is, you know, those roads are coming together pretty quickly. Yes. This, this is the right. future. This is the world that we want. And I thank you for helping build it. Well, the sign when we come in the lobby here says 5G is going to change everything. And yes. um, and I'm a believer now. So thanks, JC. Thank you. We want to thank Michael Mansori and his team at Meet Mo while we're saying thank you. An incredible platform we've been using to bring you this series. And now he's going to tell us about how 5G and Meet Mo are changing production. Welcome, Michael Mansori. Thanks for all your help. For something easy or ordinary. And as just when you reached out to the Meetmo team a few months ago for this series focused on 5G, and your mission statement was very simple. You said, AIS can't just talk the talk. It needs to lead, which is exactly what I did. And with our amazing partners at Verizon, 
who we've had the opportunity to collaborate with on many occasions, uh, including last year's Pro Bowl, uh, where we shot an 8K immersive and streamed it all on the 5G network. And again, we get to collaborate with our close old friends at Sony, who've been extremely supportive and really pushing the boundaries of what we can do, explore what we could do in 5G and um, high image qualities. So now, is 5G gonna change production? 5G is going to transform on how we create and consume content, just as cell phones did to pagers. The new connected audience is demanding higher resolution and higher frame rates for much richer immersive experiences. And this is where 5G truly shines, which is much wider bandwidth, lower latency. 5G combined with our Meetmo platform transforms on how we connect, collaborate, and create. So I've been here for the past few months working with our friends at Verizon and uh, JC and our dear friends at Sony, exploring the special use cases in and out of media and entertainment. I want to share our journey and our quick short deck and a video which we shot last week with our incredible director, uh, Sheldon Schwartz and his production company, Matt Mines, who are located in Hong Kong, connected to his crew in Los Angeles, to his post-production team in London, collaborating all in real time, ultra high resolution, and all connected on a Meet More platform, utilizing the new amazing Sony Xperia Pro phones and Verizon's ultra wideband 5G. So with no further ado, as Buzz always says, here we go. Let me share our deck so we can see it. So what is Meetmo? Meetmo is a hyper creative platform uh, for real time bi-directional collaboration. We virtualize connectivity to deliver hyper realistic engagement, seamless connectivity of people, and most importantly, devices. And that's where we're different from them, our normal platforms. So what is the problem that we're trying to solve? Traditional productions are bounded by infrastructure. So you're, you're locked into a satellite truck, broadcast truck, shipping hard drives. And as you can see, I'm pointing from down up on the left, you have the 2D camera that has to send the stream all the way up to all this infrastructure. So at Meetmo, we want to flip the script. So now we take a 2D camera, ultra high resolution like we did for Verizon last year, 8K and beyond, 360 immersive, utilizing the Meetmo platform, our content creators are able to log in and now be able to real-time collaborate and stream into phones, VR, domes, tablets, televisions, and computers, or the future communication devices, which are known as spatial computers. So I'm gonna give you a quick um, topology and use case, just so that we can understand how we can able to utilize 5G, Meetmo's app, and, and, and obviously the solutions from Sony. So here it is. If you look all the way to the left, I have um, showing our Meetmo app connected to a, the new Sony Xperia Pro. The new Sony Xperia Pro has a unique feature which allows us to connect directly into it with an HDMI input. And why is that important? Is because I don't need any more infrastructure. We just completely melted the way we're able to stream from a camera. And it's crazy. I can actually just take my camera, plug it into the phone, and from the phone, that is my entire monitor as well as a streaming box. And in our platform, we're not adding latency. We're talking millisecond latency, real-time collaboration at the highest resolution. But we go beyond that. Remember, what we do that's unique is we're bi-directional. So what that means is that we can also control devices on the network, whether it's connected to ISP or the internet, or, or, or in this case, 5G or LTE. So as you can see here, Jim, I have a, a DSLR, I have lights, I have audio, I have PTZ, I have a motion picture camera, and I have communications like walkie-talkie. All of this could be leveraged with our platform and incredible use case that we have with our partners at Sony to change it from just a mobile phone into an IoT bridge. 
And here's down the stream, how does it impact production and client agency and uh, in the end audiences? So if you notice the production crew is able to not only see, but also control devices in that network. And then client and agency are able to see the view and then consumers are able to view it on our platform, both in AR, VR, mobile, and desktop. And the most exciting use cases are what we're partnering up with Streambox. And what Streambox allows us to do is to encode and decode high image quality, 4K, 12-bit, 444, Dolby Vision, HDR, and send it in small packets. So it's not huge. So you can actually leverage the entire 5G cellular network and send it up onto the 5G network. Now it'd be able to connect anywhere in the world to VFX editorials and beyond. So just a quick sneak peek into our app, and then I'll show you guys the behind the scenes that we shot last week. Um, so our app, this is a, a sneak peek inside of it. So we're, we're real-time bi-directional collaboration. We leverage high resolution, ultra low latency. We also have the capability of putting inside our app these breakout rooms, and they're beyond just breakout rooms. So think about like the office. You have cubicles and you also have like conference rooms. So we're creating the same scenario inside this virtual space. So your hair and makeup, your, uh, your camera department, your production could meet in these private rooms and then re-collaborate. And inside these rooms, you have access to full walkie-talkie, push-to-talk. So they can not only communicate with people that are near set, but far, far distant set. And here's the most exciting thing in our differentiation. We're able to remote control devices. We're able to take controls of a camera that's off the grid somewhere, as long as it's connected to either Wi-Fi or our 5G or LTE, we're able to control the camera, or in this case, we can also control lights, audio, or other devices. And we're proud to announce our partnership with Sony once again. Um, we formed uh, this ability to be able to leverage their phones and turn them into a streaming capability system. And future down the line, we just want to go over some of the new upcoming products, which is our instant lease, which is really incredible, which allows us to leverage the phone again. So as soon as you hit record, it records it onto the device and it uploads it to the cloud. Now enough talking, let's show you the behind the scenes of last week's shoot with our friends at Bad Minds, and here it goes. How we create content is transforming before our very eyes, which is why we developed MeetMo, a new way to collaborate and create. MeetMo is a hyper-creative platform designed to connect you with any creator worldwide, in real time, at the highest resolution. MeetMo's app runs on the Sony Xperia Pro to provide fast, secure connectivity through antenna-optimized 5G with the world's only direct HDMI input and stunning 4K OLED 10-bit display. Streaming a live feed from your production cameras is simple with MeetMo's cloud-native platform, no matter if it's your main unit, mobile unit, or even BTS camera. Uninterrupted, real-time, global collaboration with every creative team at high quality and ultra-low latency. Additionally, MeetMo integration with Streambox is capable of sending 4K, 60 frames, 12-bit, Dolby Vision HDR footage in real time through 5G, so your VFX and editorial team can download and get to work before you wrap. A workflow previously impossible made a reality today by MeetMo. Reimagine the content creation process with MeetMo and the Sony Xperia Pro. And Jim, I'm back again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Hey, that's our show for today. Thank you for joining us for this series. Great thanks go to Barbara Marshall, HP, Rick Champagne at NVIDIA. We also want to thank the people behind the scenes here. Michael Mansori and the team at Meet Mo, Ryzen 5G Labs for their great facilities, and Sony Electronics for the equipment to help make this possible. Also, thanks to Damian Petru and his brave new media team.
and our friends at PGA, BES, ASC, and the NAB Show. And of course, to you for joining us. These presentations will now be available on the Advanced Imaging Society's YouTube channel. Thanks for watching. This is AIS.